IBM is an interesting uh, company because they really have been very, very good into, uh, into becoming a, an, an, a force of change. And that has been uh, going on for uh, quite a while. In the last 10 years, I think they came, they were, they used to be the, uh, the, the big corporate where nobody gets, got fired for, for uh, IBM, for choosing IBM. But nowadays, they really are always at the, at the top of the innovation ladder. And I've seen many, um, I've seen many m uh, movies from John McLean, from the, he's the VP of Global Blockchain Labs, but he always used to be in innovation. And he's going to tell us a little bit about how it's, um, what, what are the corporates doing at this moment with the blockchain innovation. So John, take it away. Thank you much. Thank you. Let me just grab this. It's probably better if I stand slightly closer to the front. If I fall off, I'll sue. Um, Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is John McLean. Uh, I'm going to kind of give you IBM's perspective and point of view on blockchain. Uh, it's an area we're very, very interested in. We are expending a lot of energy and effort into this space. And we've got a very, uh, we think, distinct point of view uh, about where we're going and where we want to see the blockchain technologies evolve and sort of develop for the future. So I'm going to give you sort of a general context to, to kind of position it in a way that, that for us certainly makes sense. So if you look at the world we all participate in, we all participate in a world of a, a business network. Uh, and it's really about connecting suppliers, uh, banks, participants together. It's often cross geography boundary, cross regulatory boundary. And wealth is generated about the flow of goods, the transfer of flowing goods in that business network. And clearly, they all participate in a market. And those markets are either public markets, so car auctions, fruit markets, or what I would say is the dominant B2B interaction, which is private markets, be it supply chain finance, bonds, et cetera. And really, what we're looking at doing here is transferring assets to build value across these business networks with the participants and in those markets. And we see two fundamental types of asset. We see houses, um, cars, physical assets, so tangible assets. We also see intangible assets. So, uh, and the examples of those really, for us, from an intangible viewpoint, break into three constituent parts that you need to think about. And this is part of the discussion about the broad applicability of blockchain. There's clearly financial assets. So think about bonds, mortgages, et cetera, securities. But also, we've got intellectual assets. Think about patents, wills, contracts. Think how you do power of attorney. Okay. I don't know what it's like to buy a house in Holland, but certainly in the UK, when I, when I buy and sell a house, I can't do anything without a lawyer. By the way, are there any lawyers in the room? Hands up. Oh, a couple. Okay. So I have to be careful what I say. Um, but the way it works in the UK is when you buy and sell a house, you basically pay your lawyers to actually all get in the phone and agree that the asset transfer is valid and the money and the title deeds are in the right place. And for that, I pay three and a half thousand pounds per average house transfer to the lawyers. Okay? And there's a lot of debate around that, um, looking at government and government regulatory control and what they're looking at with wills, et cetera, et cetera. But more interesting is you start looking to the future. Think about digital assets. Uh, how many people here have got an iTunes account? Okay. So what happens when you die? I know it's a little bit of a morbid subject, but there's no secondary market currently for your iTunes account. You can't resell that. And what we're seeing now, and I'm certainly experiencing it as a father of a uh, 23-year-old uh, and 21-year-old, they're buying vinyl again. So there's two shockers in this. A, vinyl's back. Right? The other really interesting thing is why they're buying vinyl. A, they like the, the sound, but more importantly for them is there is a secondary market in vinyl. They can resell those assets, those physical assets, and not lose a cent. Okay? So think about the future of digital assets. So we're talking about music here, but it's also going to be video. Think about digital photographs in the future. Think about your medical health records. Think about your medical imaging data. Think about your genome data. How are you going to control that permission access to that digital information? So we're starting to see blockchain have broad applicability. Now, cash is an asset, but it's got the property of no linkage with identity. And I'll kind of touch on that in a bit in the future. So in this world of business networks that we all play in and interaction, 
The ledger is, is key. It keeps the copy of record for the people participating in that world. And we really deal in a world of transactions, OK? Pushing assets on and off the ledger. And often, there'll be some contractual controls or agreements around the side. So in our world, blockchain is a shared ledger technology. Again, I'm giving you IBM's point of view here to allow any participant in a business, in a broad business network, to see the system of record, the copy of record for the business, all those participants. Nothing more, nothing less. Because the problem we have today, uh, and I used to have the, the honor of running IBM's integration technology for IBM, uh, and it really is about linking all these different parties together. And the dominant technology that used here even within a company, 80% of the time, it will be file transfer within a company. Okay? So when you start talking about a business network where you're dealing with other banks, other parties, regulators, government authorities, shipping companies, distribution networks, the network, frankly, becomes very fragmented, disjointed, inefficient, expensive, and as we touched on earlier, pretty vulnerable. So the solution in, in our ter parlance and terms is uh, uh, permissioned, shared, replicated ledger. And it's key to understand permissioned. So what do I mean by that? I mean you are permissioned to see the transactions that you are titled to see on that business network, on that ledger. So if this was actually three banks, party A, party B, party C, party A is permissioned to see its transactions and trades with B and C but it's not permission to see the transactions between B and C. But you could also set the network up. It says order to here, but you could set the network up. And I think Ron from DMB sent this earlier on. Instead of order to regulator, and the regulator could be permission to see all asset transfers or transactions within that business network in near real time. So when I say shared, replicated, shared, we understand everybody's got a copy of the data, and it's replicated in near real time. So it's important to stress that you know, blockchain is uh, the technology that underpins Bitcoin. Uh, the way we, we kind of look at this, you know, Bitcoin, the Bitcoin application was the pioneer of the blockchain technology. It's the first prototype application use case. The one thing you need to understand, though, is if you look at the blockchain technology, it's, it's 15, 20-year-old computer science. It's the way it's been grouped and aggregated together that makes it interesting and, and valuable. But there's some challenges with, with Bitcoin, and I use that as an example for cryptocurrencies. But um, it's an unregulated censorship you know, shadow uh, currency, censorship-resistant shadow currency. And that makes it quite difficult to use in any regulated industry, where you need to know who the actors are in your business network. So here's a kind of challenge. Name me an unregulated industry in Europe. There's not many. We've been trying to look. I was in Vegas when I had this discussion, and I asked that question, and everybody started laughing. Um, but it, it really is an interesting challenge. If you look at your business network, you want to know who you're participating with, what their roles are, what their permission rights are, and what they're entitled to do. So what I'd say is, you know, blockchain is not Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the, was a prototype application, a first application around this space and proved out a lot of the technology use cases, very valuable for that. But certainly for, for us as IBM, it's, it's not a use case scenario we're interested in pursuing and exploiting today. So the flip of that is, you know, so cryptocurrencies we're not particularly interested in. Digital currencies, however, and by a digital currency I mean underpinned by a fear or sovereign currency, we're very interested in. We've been having a number of discussions with, with central banks. But we need to think about this more broadly, and it's going to take some time to work through, because um, digital currencies are really going to change fundamentally how we think, and, I, and Ron again mentioned this, how we think about money and liquidity. So for those in your banking community, what's the role of M0, M1, M2, and M3 in a world where the central bank is actually the depository? Okay? And, you know, we have a lot of debates about digital currency, but I can't see any central you know, taxation authority waiving rights to A, play with interest rates, and B, levy tax against all of us. Right? And we need to bear that in mind as we start looking at digital currency. So I think it's a really interesting area for the future, 
but it's going to take a lot of regulatory control, it's going to take a lot of government interest, and the politicians are going to be uh, fatally fascinated by the taxation questions, never mind the social implications, potentially, of the government agencies being able to see where you are, what you're doing, and what you're buying, and do, you know, where you are physically. So, we started looking at blockchain uh, uh, a year and a bit ago now, and we had a look at all the fabrics, we started talking with clients like yourself, and we, we had a, we had a, you know, we, we played with everything out there, we played with all the different fabrics out there, and uh, it became pretty clear when we started talking, you know, blockchain for business, there were some core constituent parts that we needed to see. One is this idea of shared ledger, you get the uh, resiliency and, and, and the consistent view across your business network. We really like this idea of smart contracts where you can embed business rules and logic within the ledger uh, and make it uh, auto-executable uh, and also you can run analytics against it. We, we believe you need this idea of privacy, what in America is uh, privacy, um, and that really is the ability to you know, trade and transact but have privacy on what you're, you're buying and selling and who you're acting with. And lastly, this idea of consensus, our view is consensus needs to be variable and pluggable, depending on use case. So we're not wedded to proof of work by any stretch of imagination or mining. We actually believe in most business case, use cases, you know, you're gonna know who you're acting with, you know who you're gonna transact with, they're gonna have permissions and rights within that network. And as a result, you can use different methods of reach consensus that are far more performant than proof of work. So really, why is the, the business interested in, in, in blockchain? And, and I'd say, you know, I've been in to, to the software technology business for 30 plus years now, and this is the first time I've worked in a piece of technology where I've got uh, CEOs, CFOs, as well as the architecture and the engineering teams interested in this, and, and why is that? I, and the reason is, it's a little bit of a Goldilocks technology. It gives you this idea of I can have cost savings and benefits, right? I can take time and cost out of my network instead of settlement being T plus two days or T plus 30, it's T plus two minutes, okay? By having a common language across my business network, I can take intermediary steps out and reduce costs, but also because I've got this shared ledger view and I can run, uh, you know, it, it's it's, it's better from a fraud and cyber risk viewpoint. Uh, I can reduce risk and increase visibility and take time out. Then it's seen as this kind of cost saving benefit, but the same breath, I can drive an innovation agenda across some of my long running business processes that have been resistant to change for decades. So it's that double benefit, cost saving, business benefit, plus the innovation agenda around technology. So, some of the use cases we're seeing uh, as we engage with clients around the world, and we're engaging with a huge number of clients at the moment. So one is, think about this as a, a, consensus, uh, a consensus use case. So uh, this one's around bank sort codes, where each participant in the bank network updates their data, sends it to a central body that uh, updates that information, and then replicates that information out to the business network. So, really, what would happen then is each participant will own its own data, it'll update its own data in real time and then promote it and publish it across that business network, okay, to provide a consistent single view of the entire data set, as I said, in near real time. So you get this consolidation view, you get real time updates, and also you get the uh, support, natural support of code editing and, uh, coding and editing that, 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 that information and data. Uh, a really nice use case, again, that we are seeing this in the area of supply chain is the area of vehicle maintenance. Um, so if you look at the aircraft industry, uh, it's a very broad business network with a lot of participants across geography boundary, heavily regulated. So how do you get uh, provenance of each of those parts in that business network where the manufacturer can link production date with batch, with even the manufacturing machine program, the software that actually manufactured and produced that component part Okay, so really what you then end up with, the blockchain will hold the complete uh, provenance details of each component part in that life cycle and share that and make that accessible all the way through that supply chain for view and understanding and insight to what's happening in that supply chain network. So increased trust, increases the visibility and, and, and view. 
You can also start looking at uh, improved system utilization. And you can then start targeting very specific product recalls. So when you look at an automotive manufacturer, when they do a large scale recall, they usually know out of the 10 million cars that they potentially have recalled, the batch number is probably 10,000 that have the, you know, the defective component and part in it. The issue and problem from is they don't know which component went in which car on which day and which manufacturer. So that becomes a, a really interesting uh, kind of view of, of controlling the world. And again, we, we had the, I don't know whether it touched on, we had the beef lasagna issue in the UK, where we call it amorphous meat. Um, and when I start to see government agencies say, can they use this to actually have supply chain management and control all the way from farm to plate? And the same with the drug manufacturing industry and the pharmaceutical industry, can I go from manufacturing to prescription? Obvious one, uh, use case again, is this idea of a financial ledger. So this is uh, sharing uh, ledger information across a, a multinational company, across geography boundary. And this is really about giving audit and compliance uh, visibility and, and view of everything that's happening within a, a transaction period. And really what we're looking to do here is lower the costs really of audit and regulatory compliance. How do we give you a much better position to report back on? Also, it gives you the ability to do seek and find access, and it really changes the nature of compliance. Right? It changes it from a very passive, where you're waiting days, weeks, potentially after the event or after the data is live, to become a very active. You can see that information as it transacts and flows in near real time. So the final one I'll touch on is this idea of letter of credit. So, uh, you know, we've talked about uh, the letter of credit process. Thank you to VOC uh, and the, uh, the British Shipping Empire. We still use the same terminology, bill of lading, letter of credit from four or 500 years ago. And, um, you know, really this is a, a, a long running uh, process, uh, 24, 26 plus steps. Uh, and really the challenge here is how do you have a consistent view of these letters of credit out there and stop multiple presentation, et cetera. So really for us, it's about increasing the speed of execution and closure less than a day, vastly reducing the cost, but also starting to look at innovate around this very traditional, very uh, uh, staid process. We're seeing a lot of uh, companies look to how can they innovate and change this, this quite radically. So what we're seeing at the moment as we, as we interact with uh, companies around the globe is, is really this kind of steady progression through these different use cases and scenarios. We've got some clients like uh, Japanese Stock Exchange who are playing up at the high end value market. Uh, and we've got a number of other com companies playing around with Asset Exchange, Consortium of Shared Ledger, and uh, you know, uh, Compliance Ledger. One of the pieces of work we're doing with RDW, which is around how they look at sharing information across the new uh, electric bike uh, registration and management all the way through that whole life cycle, the whole business network. And you know, uh, we're we're enjoying running that project with RDW. Um, and we're seeing this idea of how do I control and manage these assets uh, as, a, as a pivotal way to driving and understanding and increasing our learning and knowledge around blockchain. So what are we doing as IBM? Um, so what we're doing is uh, we started looking at this space, as I said, uh, a year and a bit ago now. And when we looked at all the fabrics, and you remember what we said, we, we wanted this idea of shared ledger smart contracts, but with privacy, permissioning, uh, and also um, we wanted pluggable consensus, one variable consensus as technology evolves. Um, what we announced is working with partners, 17 founder partners and now 40 members, is the foundation of the Hyperledger project under the Linux Foundation. And really what's important here to us as IBM is open source, open standard, but probably more importantly, open governance. So what do I mean by open governance? It's really important when you, when you work in the open community that you A, have broad participation of other companies in that, that, that community, but also they all have a voice, they all get to say and influence the direction this technology takes and where it ultimately goes in the future. So for us, it's really important that open source, open standard, but also open governance. Uh, and as I said, you can see the the, the chairman is uh, Blyde Masters from DAH. Uh, uh, we've got Brian Benendorf, and we've got Chris Ferris from IBM as one of the leaders of the tech committee. 
Uh, we committed 44,000 lines of code to that community in February this year, and uh, we're, we're now in incubator phase uh, as we step forward. Uh, these are the other companies that are participating and playing here. Uh, I'd give a shout out to uh, a number of other companies like ABN AMRO and ING who are playing and participating in this space. Uh, and it's, it's certainly an area that um, we're seeing a, a huge amount of interest, certainly uh, for the Hyperledger project. So what are we doing as IBM to, to kind of work and understand where this market is going, where this space is going? So as I said, we call it kind of the three Cs. Um, we're doing a huge amount of work around the community uh, and the code. So as I said, uh, we've committed code. And for us, it's about this idea of permissioned, privacy, confidential, auditable, uh, and really this open governance model. Also on cloud, if you go to www.ibm.com slash blockchain, uh, we've stood up a, a beta version of our, our blockchain implementation on our platform as a service. So that's our Bluemix platform, for those of you who know about it. So you can click on that and have a 30-day free, free trial of a blockchain infrastructure. Um, because that's going to be one of my other questions. How many people here have uh, actually stood up a blockchain infrastructure? So um, for those of you who haven't, this will give you an opportunity to have a free 30-day trial, uh, which seems to be the majority of you. Um, as I said, it's on our platform as service. It's a one-click deploy. And then you can start buying and trading uh, assets and app. There's a, a demo app for marble trading. Uh, if you want to have a play, you can start looking at smart contract code and and what that means to the future. And the last thing we're doing is uh, engaging with clients. So we, we've got two kind of scenarios running. We're doing a certain amount of work around uh, you know, uh, client engagement. I'll touch on that next. Uh, and then we're also running uh, blockchain garages. So these are garage infrastructure where people come along, play with the technology, understand the technology, and, and, and understand more real where it's going and what it is and what it isn't. And we're running those in New York, London, Singapore, and Japan. And finally, running an engagement model, which is a, a fairly progressive play. So basically, doing things like let's talk. Uh, we're then running a technology hands-on laboratory. Uh, this is pretty soon going to go digital. So for those of you interested, um, let me know. Uh, but this is going to be a, a, a digital hands-on laboratory, so you can actually step through and, again, increase your learning and understanding. And then we're stepping into forced projects with a number of, of clients, as we've already said. AB and Amaral mentioned this earlier today. We've done a certain amount of work with them. We've done the work with RDW. And we're doing work with clients around the world around first projects. And that really is about experiencing what blockchain is and isn't, but also starting to look at how you integrate that with your existing environments and systems. I think Ron again said that very clearly earlier on. We're not going to be developing blockchain in isolation of our existing investments and infrastructure. It has to be integrated. It has to play with your system of records world. And then lastly, we're doing a certain amount of work around scale now. And this is kind of the, the standard progression or adoption of technology we'd expect. So we're now start, starting to do some scale project with clients with projects two and three post the initial first project. OK, with that, I'm finished. Thank you. Thank you, John. How big, uh, how big is blockchain for IBM at the moment? I mean, this is just one of your 50, uh, 50 innovation projects, or is it uh, really something you put a lot of effort in? Um, we're putting a huge amount of effort into blockchain. It's getting a lot of focus, certainly within the, the senior executive team. Um, so you know, one of the ways you can, you can sort of gauge how much uh, focus it's getting is how much time we get with our chairman and, and the senior board. And they're seeing a lot of us at the moment, which is good and bad. <laughs> yeah. And is it in the phase of investment? I mean, is it not at the moment, like when you said, the investors were saying, the ones who make money now are the consultants. Is it really a lot of money, or is it more just uh, uh, getting people excited or figuring out what to do? Is it a small, small size in terms of business? So if you look at where we are, it, look, you know, the blockchain business is, is at the beginning, right? Um, however, you know, we've committed 44,000 lines of code. Uh, for us, you know, we're continuing that development initiative and effort. We, we think it's a, a transformative area. We think it's really going to impact multiple industries. Uh, it's interesting for us, not just from a financial services space. So we see it having broad uh, applicability across pharma, power and distribution, everything. So for us, you know, blockchain is far more than just a, a fintech play. We think it's going to be 
uh, quite revolutionary in a lot of ways. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thanks for your time. It. Cheers.